Okay, let's kick things off. So again, welcome to our HealthLinks Town Hall series. My name is Lily Tenney. I'm the co-founder and director of HealthLinks based at the Center for Health, Work and Environment. We have had the honor over the last seven weeks in response to the COVID-19 pandemic to be able to, um, to host and to deliver these to employers and employees in response to the many needs that we've heard from you all. And I wanna thank you from all of our participants for your thoughtful and encouraging questions and comments that you've shared over the last seven weeks. Uh, it's been fantastic to get your input and also to hear about your experiences um, through this to understand what you on the front lines um, are experiencing and, and being able to provide resources to our network. So thank you. And thank you for joining us today on this Monday morning in May. Um, this is the seventh town hall webcast in our series dedicated to providing you with trustworthy information during these challenging times. We have uh, brought together a series of content experts, including faculty from the Colorado School of Public Health and community partners to be able to deliver the most credible and updated information, including local, state, and federal guidelines. HealthLinks is a program out of a signature program out of the Center for Health, Work and Environment. So we are based at the Colorado School of Public Health, part of the University of Colorado Anschutz. We're one of six national centers of excellence for total worker health. And our mission is to advance worker health, safety, and well-being through education, research, and practice. And that's really where HealthLinks sits as a mentoring program to serve as a, as, as a resource to organizations of all types and all sizes for advancing total worker health in practice. Some general housekeeping rules for this morning. Um, all participants, so all of you have been put on mute and you'll remain on mute through the duration of the presentation. Um, please, if you have any technical issues, use the chat function. Katie Guthmiller, our, our program coordinator, is on the back end. She'll be fielding those and can help you out. Um, if you have a question, and we hope you do, uh, please use the Q&A box in the control panel on your screen. And we're going to be leaving about 20 minutes at the end to facilitate a discussion and conversation with our guest presenter today. The webinar is being recorded and all the, the presentation and a link to that on YouTube and slides will be shared with all of the attendees and on our website after today. Importantly, there's a survey that we want to encourage you to complete at the end of the, uh, at, at the, end of the webinar. And so please just take a minute to complete that. We wanna check in with you on how things went, but also how things are going and as far as how we can gauge future topics. We're hoping to run this series through the month of June. As far as the structure for today, we have a guest presentation um, from our visiting scholar. Um, and it's going to be really focused on understanding risk communication guidance and, and really applying some, some guidelines from Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the World Health Organization and how those guidelines apply to how organizations and you all in organizations, whether your team leaders or your employers, are responding in compliance with public health um, and communicating the most important information that's coming out, which I know you know um, is, is new every minute of every hour. Um, so our hope is that you can walk away today with some, um, some good tangible strategies, best practices that you can apply in the coming weeks and months as, as things are progressing and changing around, uh, around COVID-19. So why did we pick this topic? Uh, we picked this topic because we heard from uh, participants 
that this is the number one concern that specifically employers right now are facing, which is how do you communicate effectively to workers in a way that ensures trustworthy information, um, but also eases their concerns around safety and, and especially around um, return to work. And so on a daily basis, there are articles coming out and resources coming out from all types of groups around how um, leaders and organizations should be communicating with their workers and ensuring that trust. So today we invited our guest presenter, Dr. Courtney Welton Mitchell, who is a social psychologist and mental health clinician. And her experience includes studies focused on the development and testing of health interventions, primarily for around disaster and humanitarian settings. Um, in addition, she's conducted research domestically and internationally on responses to public health messaging campaigns and crisis communication. And in addition to her current work as clinical assistant professor at the Colorado School of Public Health, um, she supports the Public Health Preparedness and Disaster Response Certificate through our Department of Environmental and Occupational Health. And she's also very engaged in activities through the, Nat the Natural Hazards Center at CU Boulder. So we're very excited to have you here today, Courtney. And at this point, I'll hand it over to, to you to share your slides. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to everyone about effective communication for leaders and organizations through COVID-19. Again, I just want to highlight what we'll be covering today. So I'll start with some examples from recent research, and then I'll move to risk communication guidance from various credible sources of information, particularly the CDC and WHO. And then we'll look at considerations for leaders and employers, particularly around barriers to working or returning to work and factors that may interfere with compliance with public health advice. Um, and this includes advice that may be coming from leaders and employers. My hope, and I recognize that this is a very heterogeneous group and those of you participating in this webinar um, may be coming to this with different expectations and hopes for takeaways. My hope is that ultimately those of you in positions of leadership will be able to design communication strategies that can support employees during this crisis. So you don't need to engage with all of this text. I just wanted this slide to be added as a placeholder. First, again, to say that there's a heterogeneous group of people involved in this webinar. And while there has been a lot of talk about we're all in this together and solidarity, which I think is really important in terms of social support and cohesion, it's also important that we're not necessarily all in the same boat, although we may all be in the same storm. Everyone has their own struggles. And my understanding is for those of you that are participating, you may come from the Health Links Network, you might be HR professionals, health and safety personnel, leadership members and organizations throughout Colorado, including many small business owners, uh, public health or Anschutz Medical Campus professionals, other team leaders, supervisors, employees. You may be in a position to be working from home, you may be beginning to return to work. You may be essential workers still working, but potentially at personal risk. You may have health workers and more on the webinar. You may be someone who's lost a job, experiencing financial strain, or someone worried about losing a job. You may be someone caring for others, children, older parents, those with special needs. You may be in a high risk group yourself. You may have lost a loved one to COVID-19 or may be struggling with your own personal health concerns. So I just want to acknowledge the challenge in providing a webinar like this and that people are coming from very diverse perspectives. So my hope is that there will be something for everyone in this presentation. And again, you will receive the slides after uh, along with the link to the webinar and there are clickable links in the slides where you can find uh, access more resources and information. So before we move on, I would just turn this over to Katie to administer the poll question. Are you a leader, manager, supervisor, or someone who is otherwise responsible for the well-being of others through your work? Yes or no? Well, 
looks like we've got a lot of responses coming in, so I'll just give it another minute here. All right, it's starting to slow down. Courtney, can you see the results? I can, great. So it looks like 71% of you said yes and 29% no, and that's fairly consistent with what our expectations were. So great, thank you. Okay, so moving on, I just wanna draw your attention first to what I found to be a useful resource, a business leader's guide to effective crisis communications. Again, in the interest of time, I'll be running through a lot of content quickly. So for those of you that really are looking for more detailed information, I hope you can engage with some of the resources that I've highlighted on these slides. This is an excellent resource. There's information on eight COVID-19 best practices in terms of crisis communications. And just to highlight a few things, uncertain times elevate the importance of clear and credible communication from leaders. Organizations most likely to survive and emerge with reputations intact during crisis are those that communicate proactively at every stage of the crisis while constantly looking ahead, balance reassurance and realism, anticipate stakeholder concerns and address them clearly and in a forthright manner, and put calm, authentic leaders forward. So I found this research that I thought was really interesting. For those of you that are interested in understanding more about the methodology and who was included, I encourage you to go directly to the publication. Basically, this is a leadership communications survey of US organizations. Again, highlighting a couple findings here. So, and sorry, I'm just gonna move this little box so I can look at the slides. So leaders have, who have risen to the challenge um, of communicating with employees are doing a few things in particular. And in general, the survey found that leaders are doing a commendable job, but there's a few things that were noteworthy. For example, when talking about organizational communications, the leaders were more likely than employees that were in non-leadership or non-supervisory positions to rate communications as effective across domains. In addition, notably, less than half of employees in the survey said that they believe their organization is extremely or very interested in hearing employee feedback during this pandemic. In future communications, respondents wanted the following. They wanted more transparency about what the organization does and doesn't know. They wanted more resources for emotional and mental health, including resources for dealing with stress and anxiety, and they wanted stronger acknowledgement of the difficulty of the current situation. In addition, they wanted to understand clear plans for the organization's future, the impact of this COVID-19 pandemic-related disruption on their role, work, and job security, more consistent, frequent, and direct communications from top leaders, and more direct acknowledgement of misinformation or rumors, more information about sick days, uh, benefits, how they can deal with children at home, family members. So this quote is from the report. Being transparent, being as clear as possible, staying calm and showing empathy are critical. These steps along with demonstrating openness to feedback and clarifying what the future looks like are top priorities for building greater employee satisfaction and trust. So let's move for a minute to the idea that, you know, there are a number of different models that have been put forward around crisis life cycle. And Often risk communications map onto crisis life cycle models such that there is a suggestion that risk communications should vary and the, the emphasis of communication should vary depending on the cycle. So you can see this model over here to the left and I'm gonna highlight a few things. One is that the suggestion is that in the early stages of a crisis, communication should be instructive, they should encourage calm and they should provide clear information about how to stay safe. And then as people begin to follow such safety instructions, there should be a shift to a focus on adjusting to change and uncertainty. And then finally, as the crisis comes to an end, ramping up information to help people make sense of and reflect on the crisis and its impact. And you see over here to the left in this graphic, at the bottom, there's a suggestion at each phase that employees are initially in phase one feeling confused and anxious, then in phase two, tending to feel uneasy or worn down, and then finally ready for change and trying to process a sense of loss. 
So again, what people need at each stage may be slightly different. And that takes us to our next poll question. So I would like to suggest that I turn it over to Katie for the poll question, what phase do you think that we are in? Do you think that we are in phase one early in the crisis, phase two adjusting to the crisis, or phase three nearing the end of the crisis? So same thing, got a lot of responses coming in. We'll just give it another moment. All right. Courtney, can you see the results? Yes. Okay. So this is consistent with my perception and expectations as well. 84% of you said that we are in phase two adjusting to the crisis. And so I think that that's important to think about, uh, as well as think about, you know, who is your audience in terms of risk communication messaging and what is their perception? You know, some people may perceive that we are nearing the end, whereas others feel very strongly that we're actually just adjusting and we're adjusting to uh, long-term implications. So moving on, I want to highlight public health communication guidelines during crises. And so, again, these are models from CDC and the World Health Organization, and there tend to be um, specific elements that people focus on. And again, you know, we can unpack this and I will to some extent in the coming slides to think about each of these components and what goes into risk communication that addresses each of these. But I wanna highlight first trust. Absolutely, trust is key. Are people going to trust the information and source credibility? Are people going to trust the source of the information? Then when we think about information, we need to know what is necessary, how will people find it, but also how much is enough or too much? Um, I'll talk in a minute about some information processing challenges that people may experience under, under times of duress. Also motivation, how relevant is the information to the people that we're trying to reach? Sometimes people feel like this information isn't relevant for me, right? So this maps on to a variety of different things, including perception of personal risk. Also, what are the conditions that surround and affect the audience? So this we will also talk about uh, briefly in this presentation a few slides in. To what extent is the group that you're working with experiencing particular challenges or barriers or difficulties um, that the messaging that's targeting them isn't really recognizing or taking into account? You have to be aware of the subpopulation that you're working with in order to make sure that your risk communication messaging is really tailored to that population. For example, sometimes I work with uh, refugee or other immigrant groups and there are specific groups that have unique needs. Also capacity, what is people's ability to act on the information? Are there barriers? Again, we'll unpack some of this. Sometimes you think that you're providing a, a clear message with specific and recommended behaviors, but there are barriers that you may not be aware of to people performing those behaviors. Uh, perception, what does the audience think of the information? What's gonna inspire them to act on it? And then finally, again, the behavioral response. How will people respond? And then what can we do to stay engaged with them and give them support as they continue to take action, as things continue to evolve over time? Okay, here we go. And so for this next slide, I would like to draw your attention to this publication on the right, the CERC publication, Psychology of a Crisis. So we know that people process information differently during a crisis. So one of the things that's important to consider is how can we simplify our messages? So people may be experiencing stress and they may be experiencing some sense of cognitive overload. They may be overwhelmed with the amount of information that's coming at them. So they may not be able to fully hear information. They may not remember as much information. They may have a hard time interpreting what appears to be confusing or contradictory information. Um, and again, sometimes in the midst of a crisis, we may be less likely to engage our critical thinking skills, and we may be taking uh, shortcuts to make decisions. So for example, we may be, you know, looking at our friends or looking to others within our network and just saying, okay, we're going to do what they're doing 
instead of trying to wade through all of the advice and guidance that may be overwhelming. So this, this principle of simplicity is consistent in any kind of crisis communications. So when we look over to the right, the stark principles, we see messaging should be simple, timely, accurate, relevant, credible, and consistent. In particular, there is some guidance around simplicity of messaging, and that is, in some cases, people would recommend, for example, if you have a specific public health mes message that you're putting together, that you stick to about 27 words, about nine seconds in terms of how long it takes to read or engage with a message or graphic, and no more than three themes. But of course, that can vary. And again, on the left-hand side now in this slide, this is around the CERC emergency risk communication key components. We want to think about trust and credibility, conveying empathy and caring in your messaging, competence and expertise, honesty and openness, commitment and dedication. Consistent messages are vital to the extent possible. Don't over reassure people. Acknowledge uncertainty. So it's important that as things have been evolving with the COVID-19 pandemic, in some cases, guidance has been changing. In some cases, new research has been coming to light that influences the guidance that's been um, put forth by, for example, the CDC and WHO. So I think it's important that when we're in a space of uncertainty, which might be uncomfortable for all of us, that we acknowledge that. You could say something perhaps like, I wish I had the answers, we're not sure at this time, and explain the process that's in place to find answers, for example, from your organizational perspective. Acknowledging people's fear, acknowledging their anxiety, acknowledging other difficulties they might be experiencing. And often, um, often it works to not only engage people in the process of coming up with appropriate messaging for your organization, but giving people specific behavioral tasks, things to do, asking more of people, asking people to be involved in supporting and helping others and disseminating information can be useful in a crisis. Also, when you're asking for a particular behavioral outcomes, particularly around health risks, it's important to give people clear instructions about actions that are easy to perform. So again, we'll talk a little bit in a minute about barriers, but if you're asking someone to do something like social distancing or wearing a face covering, you need to give them clear and simple instructions and it needs to be around something that they can do relatively easily. Otherwise, people tend to disengage with any threatening information. So let's talk a minute about trust and credibility of the message and the messenger. Key elements to building trust, again, we go back to conveying a sense of empathy and caring about those that you're speaking to, projecting some degree of competence and expertise, honesty, commitment, and personal accountability or organizational accountability. So communicate what is known and what is not and what you're doing to fill the gaps in what is not known. So I think these quotes from um, this publication on the right, the Highlighted Crisis Emergency Risk Communication by Leaders for Leaders are important to think about. This is from um, uh, Julie uh, Gerbending. This is the director of the CDC during SARS 2003. These are both quotes from Julie. And I think that they speak to how to address uncertainty. People seem to be able to tolerate you being wrong if you're honest about why you were wrong and what you were wrong about and what you're doing to correct it. But if you were ever perceived as being a dishonest broker of information, I think it's just about impossible to recover. So on the right, the quote goes on to talk about there were times during SARS when we were trying to balance being first, being credible, and being right, which is the CDC risk communication motto. And we at CDC made the conscious decision that our credibility was the most important thing. And so that honesty of, we don't know, we're sorry we don't know, we feel terrible we don't know, and that we're all in this predicament, it's a much better message than trying to pretend that you know something when you don't, or trying to reassure people when there really no, is, found, is no foundation for the reassurance. So I think these are some important takeaways in terms of you know, how to get out there and communicate with people in a context where there's high uncertainty. I think in some cases, supervisors and leaders may feel uncomfortable, they may wanna wait until they have all the answers to communicate, but this suggestion is, in fact, don't do that. Engage and acknowledge the uncertainty. And if you're wrong, acknowledge that. Also, building trust and engaging with affected populations, identifying people the community trusts, build relationships with them, involve them in decision-making, 
um, come up with, where possible, risk communication messaging that's collaborative that's community owned. In our own research with refugee groups, where we've been looking specifically at uh, public service campaigns around domestic violence or intimate partner abuse with Syrian and Rohingya refugees globally, we've noted that community design messaging campaigns can be a powerful way to change attitudes and behaviors. And this capitalizes on social norms-based approaches to behavioral change. So in other words, messages from in-group members to other in-group members are often perceived as more credible, trustworthy, and personally relevant than any messages that might be considered as coming from so-called outgroup members. This is another resource I wanna draw your attention to. Um, this is available through the link. Again, the slides and the links will be shared. Uh, this is a webinar that I attended earlier this month, Mental Health and COVID-19 Best Practice Public Health Information Campaigns. What is working and why? This is global perspectives. And there were a number of panelists sharing perspectives from a variety of different countries and contexts. And there were a few takeaways at the end that I think might be relevant for some of you. So the main points, lots of misinformation is out there. And as a result, there are credibility concerns associated with specific sources of messaging. Messaging must be tailored to the needs of a specific population. Mental health and psychosocial support is a critical component that should be incorporated in messaging campaigns and communications. And we need to think about how to reach groups that may be less accessible, not online or limited access to technology. So I wanna unpack a little bit the tailoring to the needs of specific populations. And I wanna to pivot to thinking about, essentially those of you, again, that are in leadership, supervisory roles with organizations or businesses that uh, are working with employees and trying to think about how to communicate best with employees. Consider barriers to return to work that may be unique to your diverse group of employees. For example, are there uh, members of high risk groups among your employees? Are your employees caring for others at home, children or others? Um, this article on the left I found useful that essentially highlights the childcare barriers to putting America back to work that are huge and sweeping, you know, it's not only the schools are closed, daycares, summer camps may not be running, et cetera. Also on the right, on the bottom, I wanna draw your attention to this podcast that I found useful. The useful, this is a labor and employment podcast, challenges in returning employees back to work after COVID-19. So this may include some ideas that you thought about and other things you may not have thought about. Again, when we think about engaging employees, engaging employees and asking them what those barriers are can also be a useful strategy to encourage buy-in in terms of any associated messaging that's coming out. Now I just want to go on and speak in brief about some social science research that's relevant to understanding factors that can influence compliance with public health guidance. So we might think, you know, why can't we stop touching our faces? What stops people from hand washing? You know, what are the barriers to mask wearing or social distancing? Or why are some people compelled to comply perhaps and some others seemingly not compelled to comply? What kind of behavioral insights can help us to better understand? So again, this webinar is a very brief presentation and part of my goal is to provide resources that you can follow up on for those of you that are interested. I would for those of you that are interested in particular subtopics. So I'd recommend the following books. Disaster is a Sociological Approach, Into the Wild, How to Diagnose, Measure, and Change Social Norms, Denying to the Grave, Why We Ignore the Facts That Will Save Us, and The Ostrich Paradox, Why We Underprepare for Disasters. These are all books that address essentially uh, risk perception, social norms, and cognitive bias that can uh, apply to the context of risk communications and health communications in particular, or any messaging that might be coming directly from your organization. I just want to highlight a few things pulled from those source materials on the last slide. So on the left-hand slide too, there's also a, a reference to an article, in crisis, people trust feelings over facts. That is often the case. Also in a crisis, people may be compelled to defer to what they perceive to be a charismatic leader or influencer and let that individual make decisions for them. We are probably all familiar with confirmation bias in the internet. You know, we tend to be in social media context often in echo chambers such that we tend to come up against information that confirms our pre-existing notions and we are less likely to be exposed to information that contradicts or challenges our existing beliefs. 
we also tend to search out information that substantiates our existing ideas. Um, in general, humans tend to focus on the short term. We tend to underestimate negative outcomes. We often want to maintain the status quo, especially in the face of uncertainty about benefits of protective measures. We have a tendency to selectively attend to only a subset of relevant facts, and we have a tendency to base our choices on the observed or perceived actions of others. So when we think about risk communication messaging, what can we do to address some of these concerns? For example, if people are looking to their in-group social members, their peers, then maybe we need to make sure our messaging is appealing to that particular subgroup or uh, community leaders or influencers within that subgroup so that we can influence the actions of the group as a whole. Additional forms of cognitive bias that may be of use to consider, uh, false consensus effect, tendency to overestimate how much other people agree with you, and this goes back to a misperception of social norms. The Dunning-Kruger effect, when people believe that they're smarter and more capable than they actually are, they can't recognize the limits of their own knowledge. And anecdotal bias, people are often more likely to base decisions on anecdotal information, personal stories instead of facts, um, especially when they're feeling anxious. So again, what can we do to address some of this in risk communication messaging? We might utilize personal stories linked to facts to engage people and compel people to act. I wanna say a word about misinformation. So one of the concerns that's been coming up is that, again, as new information comes out, there is some confusion about changing messages. And some of that confusion may make people more susceptible to misinformation, and it may undermine the credibility of some trusted, historically trusted sources of information. Um, we're seeing, again, even reputable organizations like John Hopkins has been targeted for misinformation insofar as they have had their name um, mistakenly associated with information that's being put out that is not at all consistent with their messaging. So they've tried to address this and encourage people to go directly to their website to find information, to cross check whether or not the information that they are being told is coming from Johns Hopkins is actually being, is actually coming from Johns Hopkins. And again, you know, experts suggest that when you're evaluating information you find online, confirm that it comes from a trusted source. There's just a few sources of information that I tend to look at, knowing that I find those to be trustworthy and credible and that they're providing updated timely information like CDC and WHO. So I'm trying to go on to the next slide. There we go, okay. Also, I think it's important to acknowledge, again, you know, a few slides back, we talked about potential barriers that people might face to engaging with risk communication messaging and to performing particular prescribed behaviors. And barriers can include things that uh, for some of us are, are very obvious and for others of us maybe less so. And that includes things like, for example, in this article on the left, for black men fear that masks will invite racial profiling. Or on the right, racism against Asian mask wearers is rising, it hurts everyone. So racism, stigma, xenophobia, we see rising in a variety of different contexts. Um, this messaging campaign on the bottom, the virus has no nationality. I think it's important to acknowledge some of the stressors that particular subgroups may be experiencing associated with particular asks, again, around mask wearing or other behavior. And then finally, in wrapping up, I just want to go through a few slides uh, that I think could be useful in terms of resources that you could share with employees. So we know, for example, from this leadership communications during COVID-19 survey of US organizations, and also something that is emphasized in risk communication frameworks from CDC, WHO, and others, we know that resources for emotional and mental health, including for dealing with stress and anxiety, can be really critical, and often this is what employees are asking for. We know that many people are experiencing mental health difficulties associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Feelings of grief, fear, and anxiety are common, along with sleep disturbances, difficulty concentrating, and more. And there are some links over here on the left-hand uh, side of the slide for you to follow up and look into this in greater detail to the extent that you're interested. Just briefly, when we think about stress, signs and symptoms of chronic or extreme stress, we know that 
there are behavioral signs, there are physical signs, a variety of things that can interfere with job performance as well as performance in other domains of our lives. And so when we think about you know, a certain amount of stress, it can influence our performance in a way that might be positive. But again, once we start to look at chronic or extreme stress, over time that can lead to fatigue, exhaustion, panic, anger, burnout, breakdown, disease. Um, and again, behavioral signs of such kinds of chronic stress can include excessive worry, loss of interest, wanting to withdraw, poor concentration, forgetfulness, un uncertainty, trouble making decisions, uh, feeling anxious, feeling irritable, getting in negative thinking patterns, um, increased use of smoking or drinking or other things that we might think of in excess as, as maladaptive coping strategies. So I provided this link to a webinar that I gave recently on practical strategies for supporting mental health during COVID-19. That was part of a CU Boulder uh, COVID-19 webinar series. And I would just like to end with a couple slides to highlight additional resources. So in addition to CDC and WHO, I have found the Army Public Health Center to be a very useful source of information. They have COVID-19 talking points, briefing cards, briefing templates, graphics, videos, and more that you can tailor to your specific needs. So you can see information to the right about protecting yourself and your family, other examples on cleaning and disinfection, face covering. Again, people need timely, accurate, credible sources of information. And that also has mental health benefits when people feel that they're receiving that information, again, in a timely manner, information that's digestible and credible. Also, again, going back to CDC, they have interim uh, guidance for businesses and employers and OSHA guidance for preparing workplaces for COVID-19. On the left of the slide here, you see top tips to protect employees' health. And then at the bottom of the slide, resources related to employee performance and well-being that may also be useful for some of you. And this includes positive relationships with supervisors. So when we think about risk communication messaging and engaging with employees and trying to involve them in the process of say, determining what will be appropriate policies for you know, some phased return to partial work or what might be an appropriate way to communicate that information, I think it's important to think about uh, you know, all of these resources in tandem to think about the best way to approach that so that your employees are most likely to feel comfortable and engaged in the process and likely to comply with anything you're asking. So on a final note, I would just like to end on this quote. In this crisis, leaders can draw on a wealth of research, precedent, and experience to build organizational resilience through an extended period of uncertainty and even turn a crisis into a catalyst for positive change. So thank you for your time and, and listening to this webinar. And I hope that I have provided something in this presentation that can be useful for each of you. I also recognize we have an incredibly, again, heterogeneous, diverse, and presumably very experienced group on the webinar. And I hope that during the Q&A, we could also have an opportunity for each of you to share resources with one another. Thank you so much, Courtney. Great presentation. And I think you're right. I think, every, you know, everyone here is while experiencing this in their own ways um, can relate to what you discussed today and is probably thinking about it in a in a very practical sense of uh, day to day as far as what they can be doing better or more effectively so we have some great questions that have come in and i want to start off the the Q and A um, by this with this first question related to the various levels of resiliency that individuals are going to be experiencing, including their perceived risks and also their their own situations on a day to day basis. Um, as far as what your graph showed for us being in phase two. The question is, is that is when communicating in the second phase, how can business leaders messages be tailored to be helpful to people who are handling the pandemic in so many different ways? Yeah, I think that's a great question. You know, 
again, I think to the extent that we recognize diversity and we communicate in a way that doesn't invalidate anyone else's perspective, I think that that's sort of the first piece. Because I am aware that there are many people that have actually been able to um, frame the current situation in a very positive light. They've uh, been able to draw on strengths. They've been able to identify a lot of, you know, possibly surprising um, positive outcomes. You know, for example, some strengthening of bonds within families, some reassessing of priorities. But I think that often, and, and, and also people have in some cases been able to develop new skills or take on challenges. But I think often the flip side of that is that there are individuals for whom that has not been the case. Um, there are individuals who are suffering greatly and sometimes it's hard to simultaneously hold those two realities um, as a leader. And so I think if you're acknowledging both and maybe encouraging people to walk through identifying perhaps surprising positive outcomes of the current situation, while also asking people to, uh, if they're comfortable, share some of the challenges or difficulties that they face. Well, that, that's a good segue to this next question around the balance between sharing strength versus positivity and how right now there's a number of examples of organizations that have been doing a fantastic job at sharing the, the information that's credible information that's coming out. But how much of that now as we pivot to phase two and return to work where we still need to be, we, there still needs to be reliable information about processes and policies and what to do around, um, around safety concerns. Should that be balanced or how much of that should be balanced with the, those positive messages to give people hope? I mean, I, I think, Again, to the extent that you can reassure people that you're putting safety protocols in place and that you're open to their feedback, that you would like employees to be part of maybe even a, you know, advisory committees that work with leadership or others within the organization to provide some ongoing mechanism of feedback. I think that um, I have seen it be very effective, for example, when people share coping skills with one another not only because that facilitates you know, peer support, social support, social cohesion, team building, other things that in a work environment could be associated with productive outcomes, but also because that helps people to think about coping skills that they may not have considered. At the same time, I think when I've, when I've been aware of people sharing, you know, I've learned a second language or I've you know, taken on this challenge where you know, it's something that ratchets up the expectations often the backside of that is i'm not doing that i'm barely getting along what's wrong with me or maybe some conflict or undermining potentially cohesive processes when people are again in the same storm but not in the same boat and so they're coming from very different vantage points so i think that you know to the extent again that leaders can involve employees in advisory mechanisms where there's a regular feedback, then you don't have to be a mind reader about this because you can put such questions directly to your employees. Yeah, I, I think that's really an important point and I loved your connection between effective communication and the impact on resiliency and, and mental health and coping um, because of the, the danger of having communications um, be effective but not circling back to um, the realities of operationalizing that. I think that uh, as it relates to remote work, we've been hearing from employers and employees that, that um, feel very supported and, and hear from business leaders that there is understanding and that there's flexibility, but at the end of the day, if that's not put into practice with some very you know, practical um, adjustments to Things I think employing or engaging employees to participate in that conversation hits on how important that really is. Um, I want to 
I want to now uh, talk about a couple of questions that have come in about return to work and the concern about it potentially being too early, um, what is the right and wrong way to do it, um, the best timing for that. And, you know, we in very real time at the center are consulting with employers on this very topic across health and safety compliance, um, what's happening on, uh, P on PPE, but also um, giving people choices. And I'm my question that can reflect a couple of the questions that come, have come in through Q&A um, is around that very choice. So how can you effectively, in this phase of return to work um, and bringing identified groups of workers back, um, how can you effectively communicate and ensure equity that the workplace is reopening, but that the individual worker may still have a choice in continuing to work from home. So I think this is a, an incredibly challenging question that I can appreciate is on many people's minds right now. I mean, again, I would uh, preface anything I have to say by emphasizing that there is a diverse experience group of webinar participants and they may have advice and suggestions for one another. So maybe we can facilitate that again through sharing of information in the, the Q&A forum. But I think that to the extent that again, you have this mechanism for constant feedback in place with employees and you involve employees in decision making and recommendations where they feel heard and they are also, again, you're delegating some responsibility to them for taking on the challenge of what will this look like for my particular business or organization? How will we deal with the fact that some people may not be comfortable returning, may want to continue working remotely if that's an option? You know, some people in high risk groups, in fact, may be um, perhaps we should discourage them from coming or, you know, whatnot, how to put something in place that does provide choice and does address the diversity because this is a very complicated issue that will be unique for each business setting. Thank you, thanks. Um, another question related to the, the vulnerable populations and this, um, this I may be able to respond to as far as recommendations for return to work for, for these employees as it relates to communications. Are there things that business leaders should be thinking about, even language that, that we should be using um, to uh, protect those workers um, and not have them feel singled out? So you mean particular vulnerable subgroups? Um, right. Yes. So I think that, you know, again, to the extent that you could actually involve um, particular groups directly in suggestions about that. So if you wanted to form a group among your employees of, you know, those that are um, of older age or those that are of particular ethnic or racial groups, I think it would need to be a voluntary inviting people to participate so that they don't feel singled out so much as invited to contribute to um, ways that their own concerns could be addressed adequately. Because I think that um, there is some pushback where people feel like an identity has been you know, thrust upon them. For example, if someone feels like uh, they have been lumped into an at-risk group by virtue of age alone, and there's the potential for ageism or other um, unintended negative consequences to come from that, when an employer, in fact, may be just looking out for their well-being. Yeah, and if I can just comment on that too, I, I think that this situation involves multiple levels of communication. So, you know, what you just spoke to is really across the organization, what should be communicated. Um, and I, I think it's in some of our past town halls have hit on the the times that are also important to have one-on-one -on -one conversations. So if you're thinking about your position as 
of, as a leader in an organization, when is it most appropriate to have more of a mass communication to your to your employees versus having more of that one on one or team check in um, to communicate some more of these sensitive uh, topics and have have these conversations one on one. I think that's a great point. If I, I could just follow that up by saying that, yeah. you know, sometimes in in terms of staff welfare and mental health frameworks for organizations, we think about um, particularly in high risk professions, for example, when I've worked with humanitarian aid workers deployed to, um, you know, insecure settings, we think about uh, mandatory mm -hmm. opt out check ins. So in other words, instead of just saying I'm available anytime, please come to me if you have questions, you actually actively try to check in with each individual employee and if they choose to not engage, it's their option to opt out but it's somewhat more effortful, frankly, to opt out than just to engage. And so it provides a safe opportunity for people to check in and to not feel that they've been singled out for some reason. Thank you, that's great. Um, I'm gonna, we have time for a couple more questions. And so this next one is related to what you talked about around trusted sources of information, which now has a whole new meaning to you know to me and i liked your recommendation for you know pick a couple of sources that you trust um, and pay attention to those and what's being updated but how should a manager communicate when what they need to say really contradicts the trusted sources of or, or other leaders in their organization i mean i think that's a challenge again maybe others on the webinar can provide advice i think that high uncertainty often results in relatively high anxiety and to the extent that your employees feel that dominant credible sources of information are saying one thing and you're saying another thing that's going to be a hard contradiction to resolve unless you can have an open dialogue about why those contradictions might exist and how you're still doing what you need to keep them safe and again you know others might might have other suggestions but i think this also goes back to to the extent possible in your particular business or organization can you provide people with some options and choices that's great so to wrap things up um, i have a very practical question for you what do you feel are the mo are the top two things all business leaders should be doing in this phase two of return to work every week to communicate effectively with their teams? Well, I don't know about the frequency about whether weekly or, or more or less often, but I can say that my top two recommendations, one would be some mechanism for delegating authority and engaging employees in a feedback um, process. And so you're collecting feedback recommendations and you're, it's, it's essentially an iterative process. So you're adjusting maybe some of the protocols as well as the associated messaging based on that feedback as things begin to evolve and change over time. Um, the other thing that I would do is, Again, to the extent possible, depending on how large your organization is, maybe you can delegate authority to others in supervisory roles within your organization, but come up with some mechanism for checking in, particularly ideally with everyone, but particularly with individuals who are less likely to come forward and volunteer to be involved in advisory councils or the like. Great. Thank you. So Courtney, again, thank you so much for your time. I know you're, um, you're a very busy um, person and I just wanted to thank you so much for providing this information. We didn't get a chance to, uh, to answer all the questions today, but you're in luck. We have another town hall lined up for this week, really because the topic is um, is happening front and center. And, you know, we probably, if we could have held this, you know, two weeks ago, we would have. But on Thursday, May 14th, from 1 to 2 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, 
Our center director, Dr. Lee Newman, will be moderating a presentation with Dr. Mike Van Dyke from the Center for Health, Work, and Environment on health and safety best practices for return to work. So there were a lot of questions that came up um, in our Q&A about, about return to work and uh, the, in, whether it's the um, vulnerable populations and um, ensuring privacy around those conversations, but also what is the what are the right things to do? Um, and a lot of questions and uncertainties that exist around this right now. And so both Dr. Newman and Dr. Van Dyke have been working with um, with governmental agencies, um, but also with industry on this topic for the last four weeks and are going to be joining us on Thursday to talk specifically about meeting local, state, and federal requirements for reopening workplaces, um, ensuring safety measures for employees, um, and also to protect employers, and specifically starting um, discussing operations including testing, screening, uh, personal protective equipment, and face masks, social distancing and uh, cleaning and sanitation and, and uh, that things like ventilation. So please join us on Thursday. We'll send out, uh, actually the registration link is up on our website, which I'll provide a link to at the end of this presentation. Um, it should be very, very relevant to every, everything that you're experiencing today. I also wanna remind you that we have a um, a res in our resource center, we have some quick sheets on um, mental health, um, and I think that that relates to a lot of what we talked to um, you about today: mental health, resiliency, and coping through COVID. Um, and we also have a full COVID nineteen resource center with the, a lot of the links that Courtney presented here today. So make sure to check that out. Um, and, and lastly, um, in the last two weeks, we are starting to offer employer advising for a number of topics related to the pandemic, including health and safety compliance, what you need to, to understand as far as enhanced safety measures for return to work, um, PPE, ac workplace accommodations, remote work accommodations, um, and things like total worker health leadership, crisis and risk management, mental, mental health well-being, things like ergonomics. And so this is an offer to you as business leaders, um, but also in your networks. If you are um, at a place where you have questions, then we would love to partner with you. Um, and we are offering virtual consultation at no cost to employers, and, and that can be you as an individual or a team from your organization. Um, and if that leads to, um, to a more in-depth consultation, we can help you get to experts that can provide that, that level of assistance. So how do you uh, get there? Um, send us an email at contact at healthlinkcertified.org. And as a reminder, we are a, you know, a group of occupational health and safety and total worker health professionals uh, based at the Center for Health, Work and Environment and um, would love to be a resource to you during this time. So please stay connected to us. Um, get in contact with us to uh, schedule your, your free COVID advising session and join us on Thursday um, for our next town hall webcast. Thank you so much for joining us today um, and I wish you a happy and well and safe week. Take care. <laughs>